We're going to do something a little different than what we've done in the past. Usually the October meeting had centered on networking, which of course is a very critical and important aspect of your career development. But uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about life in general and the direction that we have and, and with directions that we can go and how we can really be happy leading the lives we lead. A lot of mentors, I'm sure, are speaking to you about these kinds of uh, subjects, but uh, I hope that tonight will encourage a lot of great discussion with your mentors and, and mentees. Um, so I look forward to a fun last 30 minutes of discussion time that we have. Uh, to begin our speaker introduction, I want to pose a question to the group. And that is, what do 600 attorneys working in a state attorney general's office have in common with the winner of the Indy 500, Fortune 500 execs, and a G20 head of state? They have all been Michelled. Yes, folks, we're going to use that as a verb. And that means that for more than 20 years, our speaker tonight, Michelle DeAngelis, has been taking on impossible corporate challenges and solving them in record time. She's an accomplished management consultant, corporate coach, facilitator, speaker, and author with an impressive list of Fortune 500 excuse me, clients and satisfied individuals that have taken her coaching advice and are leading happier lives. She has held senior leadership positions, managing hundreds of employees and multi-million dollar budgets. Uh, and 15 years ago, she started her own management consulting firm, Michelle Inc., where she does strategic planning, manages national projects, and coaches executives on leadership-related uh, projects. She does take on crazy projects, the ones that no one else will take on, because her belief and mantra is that there is always a way. Tonight, she's here to tell us how to get a life that, as the title of her book describes, doesn't suck. Please join me in welcoming Michelle DeAngelis. Thank you, Lily. Hello. I have to say, I am really glad to be here tonight. And I know every speaker you've ever heard always says that. But I really am glad to be here tonight, because I nearly wasn't. Um, I had several things that suck happen to me yesterday and today. And I really got to live my book. So I thought I would start with a very quick story. And then I'll um, go on to some recognition of some people in the room. Yesterday, I was trying to get out of JFK. I was in New York for about a 48-hour meeting. and. Randomly, out of the blue, I had my boarding pass. I'm checked in. I was actually a little bit early because I have this whole thing about being on time because I like to do what I say I'm going to do, which is a, like chapter seven in the book. Um, and I damn well better be living this book, right? If I'm going to have the nerve to write it, I better live it. So I was there a little few minutes early. I had my boarding pass. And all of a sudden, I get the raging nosebleed from hell, okay? Which is gross to begin with, right? It's kind of like, mm, don't talk about that. But the second thing is, what do you do? You know, I'm at like gate nine at JFK. And first of all, I'm convinced someone could get stabbed at gate nine and no one would do anything. But I sat there and I thought, okay, what do I do? So I quick, you know, grabbed some tissue, whatever, went to the bathroom. And I was in the bathroom dealing with a bloody nose, which is not, I don't have a health condition. It was just like some weird thing. And what flashed through my mind was, uh-oh, I better get on this plane because I have a speaking engagement. And, you know, was, I landed, you know, late. And uh, so 50 people came and went from the ladies' room. And it's pretty obvious that you know, I'm having an issue. And I was all composed and together. And cause, but after 40 minutes, I thought, OK, this could be a problem. So one of the ladies happened to say something. And she goes, oh, I'm on your flight. Let me go talk to ground control. And so someone came in and said, OK, we'll, we'll hold the flight. But you'll need to make sure that you're flyworthy. Flyworthy? Crap, you know, how do you show your fly worthy when your nose is bleeding, right? Like a big gusher. So I said, okay, well, the way that I do it, because as she, as Willie said in my introduction, that there's always a way. So the way that I decided to do that was I had somebody bring me an ice thing. I was squeezing. I mean, my nose was like purple. I was squeezing it so hard. And uh, I thought, and it's, it had diminished but had not abated. And I thought, okay, well, there's always a way. So, of course, I do the gross thing, and I cram all this tissue up my nose, and I put on makeup like everything's perfect. And I go as fast as I can from the ladies' room to the gate nine. And of course, I'm the last person on the plane because everybody else is boarded. And the man looks at me, taking my boarding pass. He goes, are you, as I'm like flying by, thank you, got to run. And he said, are you sure you're OK to fly? I said, perfect. 
just blew right on by as you know the precious seconds were passing before I got to my seat and took care of the rest of the problem. So I really am glad to be here, right? And there's always a way. You just have to find it, even when things are really difficult. So I, uh, I want to thank a few people. I um, want to thank Willie and Jennifer for all the arrangements for tonight. Um, and I want to thank Kevin, the audiovisual tech, especially because he's the guy that does the tape. And yesterday, because one of the other things that sucks that happened to me was I went flying off the cement stairs as I was racing from the airport and um, did a face plant. You know, like when you go skiing, it's called a yard sale. And your stuff goes like 15 feet in diameter everywhere. Now, I usually don't have days like this. I, I have someone in the room who can attest to that being pretty unusual for me. But I'm happy to have Kevin here tonight, making sure that things are taped down so that I don't do a flying leap again. I still have like scabs on my knees from yesterday. And I want to thank uh, my assistant, Kelly, who's always there for me. Thank you, Kelly. And the alumni mentors, because I am very sensitive that everybody in this room is really busy. And there are a lot of ways that you could spend your time. And for those of you who are, who are students in the room, you are getting an incredible life gift from your mentors. And I'm sure you know it. Uh, I wasn't fortunate enough to have, have something like this, although I had great parents who were very entrepreneurial. And they would do what your mentors probably do, which is occasionally kick me in the butt and then occasionally pat me on the back. Um, so I just want to have you take a moment and um, express gratitude if you're sitting by your mentor. Please thank them for the time that they're giving you. <laughs> That's chapter nine. <laughs> and then finally, I want to thank um, someone in this room who is not only an incredible human being and someone with whom I've had the, the honor and pleasure to work very closely under circumstances that sucked, um, is Bob Satilli. Bob, why don't you stand up just for a second? If anybody is sorry I came tonight, blame it on him afterward. <laughs> uh, Bob, I, um, you know I love you dearly from the heart. And Bob and I had the opportunity. You, do you remember in my bio when Willie was speaking, she said impossible corporate challenges? I inserted that after I met this man. Because he works for a company called M Squared that, um, thank you, Bob, that, that brought me in on the hardest project I've ever done in my entire life. And... I've done some crazy stuff. And um, so, Bob, I want to thank you for having the confidence and the faith to not only work with me and um, engage me, but also to recommend me for speaking here tonight. Thank you. Um, and anybody who has him as a mentor is just, like, blessed. So, thank you. So, get a life that doesn't suck. Um, raise your hand if you went online to take the quiz. Raise your hand, keep your hand up if you were the one of the ones that took it in the last 30 minutes before tonight. <laughs> I love you guys. It was so funny. I, I, get a, I get an email every time somebody takes the quiz. And I, as I was, I was driving here with Kelly, my email was like, ding, 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 ding. I was getting like, you know, dozens of them. Um, so I knew several hundred of you had taken the quiz, many of you in the last minute. So bless your heart. <laughs> so tonight's takeaway is understanding the gap. This is really the main premise of the book. And uh, actually, I should have asked. I'm sorry. Can everyone hear me okay? Are we good to go, even in the back? Okay, wonderful. Um, and so what you say is the gap. The gap is the difference between your thoughts and your actions. So for every time you have said, I'm going to get up every morning this week and go running, you laughed. Did you get up? Good. What about yesterday? OK. So and thank you for that. So the gap is every time you think something and don't actually act on it, assuming it's a good thing, then you are in your gap. So, ooh, I've been trying to lose that five pounds, but I'll have that third piece of pizza. Or, you know, after the 14th round of beer pong, I should probably go home and study. <laughs> And you don't, that's you in your gap. So you know who you are. 
So tonight when you leave, I want you to understand the concept of the gap. It is not radical, but very few of us think about it. And once you start to think about it every day, you, you begin to close your gap. You begin to align what you think with what you do, and life sucks less. Okay? So that's the takeaway from tonight. So I have a really long over a bottle of wine story that I tell about why I wrote this book, but you get the short version. I wrote this book because there are 35 million people in America who are unhappy. 35 million people. That is 15% of all adults in the U.S. are not too happy. And there are some other bleak statistics. But I really wrote this book for these 35 million people and the people they know who get on their nerves. Okay. For me to think that there are 35 million people in the world that don't know there is a different way to live, that you can choose how you respond to what shows up in your life, made me think, I better write the book. I heard you go, hmm. Does that resonate with you? Okay. That'll be our little secret. Nobody in the back can know. The next thing is, I wrote this book for my clients. I, I show up in corporate America obviously, all the time. That's my, that's my day job. And I have looked into the eyes of thousands of people, and I've seen nobody home. I've seen those dead eyes where people are checked out, punching a clock, can't wait to leave. And there is a different way to show up at work. Next reason is my mom. My mom... Um, an incredible woman. I'm really one of those like freak lucky people that had two really great parents. And um, my mom was vivacious and terrific one day and dead 34 days later in my arms from a brain tumor. So just let that settle in. How many of you still have your moms? Raise your hand. Okay? That's a lot of you. I want every one of you to text, I am, email, call, snail mail, ring the doorbell, of your mother if she's alive because you never know, okay? Put it in your Blackberry. I love you that you're doing that. I was just going to say that. It's Jake, right? Yeah. Okay. Tell me that you're, like, not checking messages or shopping online, <laughs> but, but really you're making a note to call your mother. He's doing it right now. I love that. Start, do it now, chapter four. Love you. What a setup you are. So I'm serious. I wrote it for my mom, and I wrote it for everybody else's mom, because we need to let them know what a difference they make in our lives. And then my calling. So the really funny story is I wrote this book, and I'm incredibly determined. And yes, I have bad days and bloody noses and other weird things that happen, but I made a decision. I was writing a book that lined up with my mission. And my mission, I didn't even figure out what my mission was on this planet until, my gosh, I was probably... 40. And my mission is to raise the level of joy on the planet in a meaningful and tangible way. So it's not just to be, you know, happy-go-lucky all the time. It's to show people very specific techniques to make a difference in their day and the day of the people they come into contact with. So I take this mission very seriously. And people look at me like, you know, I'm like the joy village idiot. You know, what's, what's your deal? Who does joy? I'm sorry. Joy is like silly. Joy is pixie dust and unicorns and all that stuff. But you know what it really is? Joy is feeling alive in the best way you know how every day, every hour, every minute. Every minute. So I want to dedicate tonight's um, talk to a former University of uh, Cincinnati student named John. John is a friend of uh, a dear, the son of a dear friend of mine. And uh, John belongs to a fraternity house at the University of Cincinnati. And he was having a rough go of it. It's in his sophomore year, or excuse me, his junior year now. And had a bunch of buddies at the frat house. Seemed to be having a good time. But pretty soon, he started not showing up at parties. He started missing class. And the reason I'm dedicating this tonight to John is because John killed himself two days ago. 
because nobody saw what was happening inside of him. And nobody, even if they saw it, knew what to do or took the time. So I want everybody in this room to just think a little good thought for John's parents tonight. Because I, thank God, cannot imagine how they're feeling. But each of you tonight can make a decision to leave here and change your life, change someone else's life, change this campus one person at a time, change your workplace for the big grown-ups in the room, change your workplace one person at a time. So here's to John. So it was very important for me to get this mission on paper. And I wrote my book and did it really wrong the first time. You must be thinking, wow, I'm so glad they brought her to speak. She gets bloody noses, falls down the stairs, and writes the book wrong. Okay, really what it is is I wrote it wrong because I didn't know this one thing. And I now know it. It is one of the important things I learned writing the book. I needed to meet people where they are. I wrote a book all about joy, how to create joy. I wrote this book, this book this same book, and I called it Planet Joyride, right? The Owner's Manual. Okay, well, everybody hated the title, but it was all about joy. I could not give the book away. Couldn't give it away. I got rejection letters. I mean, I started to hate my mailman. And I thought, okay, so I wrote it. I did it wrong. I'll do it right. I'm still going to write the book. It's all going to be fine. I go down to Cabo San Lucas because I figure margaritas and some sunshine are exactly what the doctor ordered. Jake is going there tonight after he calls his mom. And um, so I go down to Cabo San Lucas, and I'm, I'm pretty resilient. So for everybody in the room, remember this word, resilient is good. And I thought, you know, just because 50 people hated it doesn't mean it can't work as a book. So I uh, was sitting there writing, having my margarita, and this big love of, lug of a guy, complete stranger, was sitting on a beach chair in front of me, and I, I was writing longhand. And... He was from, he was from Joyzy. And he goes, hey, you an author? And I said, no, I'm trying like hell to be. And, you know, it's not working, but I'm going to get it. And he goes, what's your book about? And I'm sure as hell I'm not going to tell this big Jersey dude it's about that joy, right? It'd be like, joy. You know? <laughs> and he'd look at me like I was an idiot. So I'm sitting there, and I'm sipping on my margarita. And I said, you know, It's all about how to get a life that doesn't suck. He goes, oh my god, I love that book. I know 20 people who need that book. you got to write that book. (laughs) And that's how the title was born. I finished, um, I may just change like, you know, 200 words, came home, sent out the book proposal, had 34 literary agents want to represent the book, and three months later I sold a three-book deal to Rodale Publishing, biggest independent publisher, and my number one choice for a publisher. So I just am sharing that with you because I wrote a book about something that was very important to me, and I was determined. I was going to fight like hell to get the book out. But I had to change the positioning of the book. And as Kevin Arsenault from Crack, Kevin, raise your hand. Where are you? I'll be picking on you frequently. Um, As he said, oh, man, you just had to make it about attitude. I had to meet people where they were, and where people is is in the stuff that sucks, right? People aren't in the joy place, at least not very often. So the minute I changed it, the book took off. Okay. So we have to start from where we are. And where are most people? They're in their gap. They're saying they're going to go run, and they don't go run. They're saying that uh, they'll have the report on your desk by 5, and they don't. The gap, that, that place where misery lives, right, where all these feelings live, the gap makes you feel out of integrity. It sucks. And every one of you has a story. I mean, I live this book like a fanatic. And I notice now, the second I'm in my gap, wow. The good news is you have two choices. You can either change the thought, well, three choices. Change the thought, change the action, or both. Sometimes people need to meet in the middle. Okay, so the next time you are feeling anger, resentment, Doubt, guilt, bitterness, you're in your gap, and there's something for you to take a look at. 
So what I'd like for you to do is grab a pen and a sheet of paper as opposed to like your mentor's hand. And I would like for you to write down four words. I love it. Every mentor has like three pens. It's perfect. Okay, so the four words I want you to write down, leave room at the end, okay? So the four words are, I wish I would. I wish I would. And then blank space. I wish I would. Okay. Now I want you to think about something that is within your influence. So I'm not interested in win the lottery as the answer. I want something that is within your influence, and I want you to fill in the blank. And yes, I'm going to do some sort of pencils down at the end just to get that academic flair. But I wish I would take a minute and think about what do you wish? Do you wish you'd write a book of your own? Do you wish you would get to class on time? Do you wish you would finally take that vacation with your wife? Do you wish you would learn how to cook? I wish I would. And you know you have to write it down because you know I'm going to call on a whole bunch of people. I wish I would. Is there anybody that doesn't have anything written down yet? I'm not going to pick on you. I just, well, much. Okay, good. So since nobody raised their hand, I'm sure we're good to go. I wish I would. Help others succeed. Fabulous. Starting when? Yeah. By doing what? Helping them achieve their potential, overcome okay. their obstacles, see things as they should be seen. And if you could help one person starting soon, because I want to make it really concrete for you so that you can be out of any gap on that. Because I'm sure you help people all the time. What's the one thing? What, sorry, what's the one person? A name, first name? Ken. Ken, okay. What can you do tonight or tomorrow or very soon to help Ken and remove obstacles from, from him? Give up sleep. Okay. <laughs> How much sleep do you have to give up? Okay, and so if there, if I was going to call, if you were going to call me in two days and say, here's what I did to help Ken, what would you have done? Well, organized uh, his origination facilities, set up more concrete structure for his uh, wholesale facilities, uh, get the uh, underwriting people uh, recognized that despite the fact that they're in uh, manufacturing, that they're really part of the sales arm. Okay. And Salespeople recognize that people inside are working as hard as they can and how they work. Get their job done so they get better results out of it so they can set with it. Okay. Focus on getting the positives. So I just want to point out it went from something that was about 30,000 feet down to maybe about 10,000 feet now, maybe 5,000, because we have a person, we have a desired, general desired outcome. So what is one Behavior that Ken would demonstrate that show that would show that you helped him. Compensation. That's not a behavior. Okay. Nice try, though. <laughs> a 
think that's a noun, so just give me a little more. So what would he specifically do? Ken would, and then fill in the blank. As a result of me helping Ken, he would? Compliment his job well. Okay, and then he would? Well, the reward for good work is more work, so I probably get more work. A deserving punishment. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Of course. Okay. Um, but you get the point. Yes. And so what I want you to do while I'm picking on the next victim yes. is to please get your calendar or your Blackberry or your scroll or whatever you yes. use and write down that you're going to call Ken, okay, or meet with Ken. I'll be watching. I want to, I want to see it written down. I want it's so tempting to pick on Jake. He's right in the front row, so I'm not going to do that. Let's hear from you. I wish I would. I'm going to have you say it right into here. Start cooking more. Okay. You stole mine. I love that. Okay. The best thing I make for dinner is a reservation, right? So, um, so starting when? Well, you can't start now, and there's no olive oil in the room. Okay. And so what could you do tomorrow that would... I mean, we can heat water and open a mac and cheese. But what's, what, what do you want to do? How do you want that behavior to show up? I have to get the mic for you, I think. Actually, I'm going to pick on you. Just come up here. I know, public humiliation and you have to cook. OK, go ahead. What was the question? Uh, it was, what's one behavior that would tell you, that would get you out of your gap? Because right now you're thinking, I want to cook, but you're not cooking. So what is something you would very specifically do that would let you go, yes? Um, go to the grocery store first and buy all the groceries. OK. <laughs> and can you do that tomorrow? Yeah. Funny how those, like, this plus that equals that, isn't it? OK. So um, what time are you going to go to the store? After my class, so like 2 o'clock. OK. And what are you going to make? I think Indian food. Indian food? Yeah. Okay. Is there anybody in the room who either lives with you, knows you, can hold you accountable, your mentor? My roommate. Okay. Well, who's the roommate? Oh, she's not here. Oh, okay. Oh, here? Yeah. Um, anybody here? Does anybody here know this woman? Okay. Perfect. Will, will you please hold her accountable? So do you have her cell phone or her email? Okay. So, so if you haven't heard from her by, what's your name? Okay. If you haven't heard from her by 3 o'clock, Get on her, OK? Because we know she's in her gap if she hasn't gone shopping by 3 o'clock. Deal? Yeah. Right? OK, let me get you a book. OK. Thank you for that Thank very you. much. Don't forget, 3 o'clock, OK? So did you get the essence of that? I know we could do a lot of those, but I want to point out to you, if each of you would take a minute to do your I wish I would. I wish I would. By when? <laughs> How does it show up? Put it in my calendar. Make a date with myself to get out of my freaking gap. Have my thoughts line up with my actions. Or change the thought. If your I wish I would is looking like a nightmare now, rip that sheet of paper up and make a new one. Change the thought. OK. So these are symptoms of a gap. As I said, if you're in those or you're feeling those, change the thought, change the action or a little of both, OK? So there are two antidotes to what sucks. The first one is to reduce the number of problems you have. I have a very specific formula to do that. It's called the 10 life-changing ahas. They are things you do every day, every week, need to do every day, every week, and you will reduce the number of problems you have significantly. I have about 10,000 people doing this right now. I mean, I have more that have bought the book. But I, I have 10,000 active people who live by these 10 ahas, and their lives are different. The second thing you can do as an antidote to what sucks is consciously handle the problems that do occur. So when you get the bloody nose, or the plane is canceled, or you get a flat tire, or you know whatever, your car, you blow a gasket, literally, not figuratively, you need to know how to handle those problems. So those are the two antidotes to what sucks. Tonight, I'm going to spend probably the next 20 minutes going through 
both of these, but the biggest one will be the 10 life-changing ahas. So, at the end of the evening, or after you've read the book, or after you've done whatever you want to do, taken the quiz and check things out online, your thoughts and actions will be aligned, no gap, and you'll know how to make the best out of every situation. So, the first life-changing aha is choose. You always have a choice. Now, one of my favorite stories about this is, it's actually a kind of a fable or parable. Back in the old days of the knights, there was a court jester who, obviously, his job was to entertain the king. And he knew all the right buttons to push, and he knew all the ways to entertain and just push it right to the limit. Well, one day, he got a little carried away and actually ended up making fun of the king. Never a good idea. And he was deemed treasonous. And the king sentenced him to death. That sucks. And the king said, but you have, a, have been a wise and amusing court jester. So I will let you choose the manner of your death. And the court jester said, then I choose old age. <laughs> you always have a choice. You always have a choice. Another work story about choosing, um, this is a real story. One of my clients called me, and this is last year actually, or two years ago, and said, Ugh, I have these fabulous tickets to the playoffs, and my damn boss wants me to work late, and i got this huge thing due in the morning, and blah, 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 blah. Wah, 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 wah. I'm already hearing, I don't have a choice, I don't have a choice, I don't have a choice. So I'm, I go into like my, you have a choice mode. And I said, well, of course you have a choice. And he goes, well, yeah, I could choose not to go to the game. What kind of a chump would do that? And I go, no. What about this? What about you say to your boss, I have these amazing tickets to the game. I will absolutely have the thingamajig on your desk and be ready at 6 in the morning. But I really want to go to the game. So why don't you trust me that I will deliver on what I say I'm going to deliver, and I'll get to do both. So the guy's kind of quiet on the phone. And I go, come on, poke holes in it. What's wrong with it? What's he going to say? Well, you know, give me all the objections. And he went and asked his boss. And of course, the boss said, well, you take me, and you can go. But no, he didn't. And he finished it. I mean, he went to the game, you know, and then finished the project, got to do both. So he could choose, but it required some huevos, because he, he had to go to his boss and ask to kind of do a workaround. Right? He chose. And there's always a way. So the first one is to recognize that you always have a choice. And any time you find yourself saying, ha, I had no choice, or, well, you know, forget it. There's really no choice. Or any variation on the words that I have no choice are in the sentence, you're missing an opportunity to make positive change in your life. So, mentors, raise your hands. Okay, so thank you. So, anytime you hear your mentee say, I had no choice, I have no choice, there was really no choice in the matter, anything that sounds like no choice, I want the <clears throat> buzzer. Okay? Yes? Um, a friend of mine has, I, the question was, uh, what do I say about fate or destiny? Um, that it was meant to be. And a friend of mine has a great saying that I live by on this very question, so thank you for your question. And it's very thought-provoking. And his, his words of wisdom are this. Destiny takes over when free will gets tired. So that's how I feel about that. Perfect. Moving on. Next one. Think good thoughts. Because your thoughts affect your life. Now, I was actually raised by a mother that kind of crammed this down my throat, right? It was the, you know, be nice on, as nice on the inside as you are on the outside, and blah, blah, all that, you know, golden rule and all that other stuff, which I actually believe in. But I got a little sick of it. And so even Michelle DeAngelis, 
was like, okay, what is the compelling reason to think good thoughts other than it's better than thinking crappy ones? Okay? There's so many compelling reasons. We don't have time. I would keep you here too long. But the biggest one is that this new science called neuroplasticity proves, I don't mean speculates, proves beyond a doubt that in addition to thoughts being shaped by the physiological brain, the brain is shaped by your thoughts. They've always thought it was the other way around, that you know your brain structure and your chemistry and all that other stuff affects your thought, which is true. They never knew that thoughts affected the actual physiological brain. So this has been proven now using functional MRIs and other techniques that show changes in brain structure. So you can literally think yourself out of problems. You can literally think yourself out of them. This is a lot, now there's now science that backs up what was formerly um, speculative cognitive behavioral therapy. It's been very successful. It's just now we have science around it. And so your thoughts affect your life. Your thoughts affect they are shaping your brain. So my favorite story about this is the story of an Olympic diver. And I literally, I have like 100 stories on Think Good Thoughts. The story of an Olympic diver um, who broke her leg two months out from the Olympics. She was determined to compete. She was determined <coughs> to compete. She made dives in her mind every day, 150 times. Every day. Perfectly executed 10, 10, 10, 10 dives. And as soon as she could get that cast off and even think about getting up on the platform, she could start diving, and it was only a week before competition, and she meddled. So they've now proven, I mean, they'll hook you up to machines and ask you to curl your bicep, and then they'll see, um, the, see it light up, and then they'll ask you to not curl your bicep and just ask you to think about curling your bicep, and the same area lights up. So I'm telling you, this is not just be happy. This is very powerful. Your thoughts affect your life. Okay? So, so far we have choose and think good thoughts. Those words, you know, you know all that stuff. This is obviously not the first time you've heard these words. You know it, but do you do it? Do you actually do it? So as soon as you get out of here and you're like, oh, hell, I'm late. I'll probably miss every green light. Because you know you're going to do that. Or, oh, man, I was supposed to stop and pick up milk on the way home. You know, my roommate's going to scream at me. No. Five minutes late, I'll, I get the milk. There's always a way, okay? So think good thoughts. The next one, start, do it now, because action banishes fear. This is the biggest cause of regret that I see in the thousands of people I work with, is they never start. Just start. Start. My friend has this phrase, she calls it a three-foot toss. <coughs> she can pretty much handle anything around a three-foot diameter of her zone. She just made this up. I love it. So if it's within three feet of her, she can either step this way toward it or she can pick up the phone and make a call. Whatever's in her three-foot zone, she can manage that. Just do a three-foot toss. So, you. What's your I wish I would? Okay. I wish I would appreciate my family more. And so do they. I love that you came up with that. It's so beautiful. And do you know appreciation is actually the opposite of fear. If it's been proven if you are busy appreciating, it's impossible in that same moment to hold a fearful thought. So you're not only helping them, you're helping you. So what's, how would you do it? What's an immediate, demonstrable way that you could appreciate your family? I'm sorry? OK. So why don't you do it right now? Because it says start, do it now. So just like punch in their number, say, Mom, I'm at this, or family, or whoever it is. Okay, just do it now. It does say start, do it now, actually, right there, number three. I'll take the phone. Yeah, 
Kitson. Who am I calling? What's his name? <laughs> calling Dad's mobile. Can we? Voicemail. Oh, I'll leave it. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> Hi, Dad. I'm calling on behalf of Michael. He's perfectly fine. Everything's fabulous. It's not his parole officer. Uh, my name is Michelle DeAngelis. We're at a speaking event, and I'm sitting in front of 300 people. And Michael has said that he is committed to appreciating his family more. And so I'm letting you know that he loves you, and he appreciates you, and 300 other people know it now, too. <laughs> okay, love you, Dad. Bye. Okay, that's what I mean. Do it now. All right? And you all have permission if, if there's something you absolutely urgently have to do. Don't wait. Okay, next one. Honor your health. Honor your health. Because everything is better when you feel good. Everything is better when, even the crappy stuff is better when you feel good. <coughs> Taxes hurt less when you feel good. I find it so interesting that we work, you know, five days a week, or we go to school, or we put in our time because we have to. Wouldn't it be interesting to view your health as something you have to take care of, something you have to manage? Now, I'm a little bit of a freak. OK, I'm a lot of a freak. And so I get up every morning at 5.30, and I do 90 minutes in the gym. Because, and I read two newspapers, and I do all this other crazy stuff, answer whatever messages. And um, so I'm ready for bear by 7 o'clock. And that's not because I'm a big superhero or because I'm trying to like brag about myself. That's because I've raised a daughter as a single mom. I've worked my ass off. I wrote a book. I did all this other stuff. I've like skimped on sleep and gone with no money and then finally made money and a bunch of other things. <laughs> Willie's looking at me like, no sleep? What do you mean? What do you mean? Six more weeks, you'll see. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. I just made up my mind that my health was not something that was negotiable. Sure, there are days I sleep in. Sure, there are times I, you know, shouldn't have that extra glass of wine the night before. I take care of my health because it is precious, and nobody else is going to do it for me, clearly, if you've watched the government lately. So everything is better when you feel good. So make an appointment with yourself in your calendar. Have your, get a running buddy. You know, get a jogging buddy. Get somebody to you know, clear all the junk food out of your fridge and start over. Take care of your health, body, mind, and spirit. I think of it kind of like money, health. That, you know, when you have it, everything's just good, goes along. And life is hell when you don't. So take care of your health. The next one, get a system. Because life is easier when you manage yourself. Yeah, I know. How many of you have forgotten anything in the last week? Raise your hand. Oh, you are so under-reporting. <laughs> OK, actually, most of you did raise your hand. So somebody give me an example of something you forgot. OK. Midterm? Oh, that little old thing. <laughs> OK, so come up here, talking to the Mr. Microphone. OK, so. <laughs> If you had a do-over to create a system that would allow you to have not forgotten your midterm, what's the do-over? Blackberry calendar. OK. And so not picking on you, but tell me what <laughs> happened so that it wasn't in there. Uh, or maybe you don't have a Blackberry. I don't know. But do you have a Blackberry? It's like one of those things where you're sitting in class and the professor moves the midterm, and you're like, oh, y'all remember? It's like, 
you know, it's like two months away, and you're like, oh, I'll remember it, or maybe someone will talk about it. And then they moved it a week up, and then you're like, oh, I Don't forgot. you hate that? <laughs> okay, now I have never done that for a midterm, but I've done that for things that I shouldn't have done that for. And uh, so I learned to get a system. So what would, what's your trigger? What do you learn from that to not have that happen again? A lot of times just writing stuff down okay. in a place. Like a lot of times I do write stuff down, but it's on these little pieces of paper all over the place. And so just <coughs> taking the time to like walk into the other room, get my calendar, write it in the calendar, not be lazy. Okay. And if you have little pieces of paper all over the place, who can relate to that? Pieces of paper all over the place. Okay, good. <laughs> Has anybody conquered their pieces of paper all over the place? Have you? Okay, let's hear. Michael. Um, you may have to speak into the microphone. You can both share the microphone. Paper all over the place. Yeah, the, the, the simplest way to deal with paper all over the place is just don't do it. So have a notebook. Keep your notebook with you. Write in your notebook. And everything is in your notebook. Or if you are a computer user, as most of us are, mm -hmm. keep everything filed. <laughs> keep all your emails filed. You know, I spent an hour today filing email so that I could find everything. That's what I do. How many people hate him? <laughs> <laughs> hate that. Thank you. You can sit down. What I'd like for you to do is anytime you, um, Miss Green Sweater forgot the midterm, anytime you notice something, oh, I better think about it, immediately write it down. I have a client, I have, I actually, she, she said I was in a meeting and there was no pen and paper and I was too embarrassed to ask. She said all I had was a Sharpie or lip liner in my purse. So you know my answer, because you know there's always a way. Sharpie, write it on your hand. Like when you're in fourth grade, like feed the dog, only I had to write down a technique to deal with problems that I'll cover at the end. Okay? There's always a way. Write it down. Now, I'm going to give you three really quick tips about systems, and then because I'm running out of time, I want to move on. But they're really useful. Anytime you need to leave the house with something, I don't care if it's your briefcase, the board presentation, your homework that the dog didn't eat, your lunch, I don't care what it is. Any time you need to leave the house and not forget something no matter what, either put it by the door, sounds really obvious, or put your keys with it. Okay? Did you read my book? Put your keys with it. I forgot my lunch like three days in a row. I'm one of those people, I'm a voracious eater. I know you wouldn't know it by looking at me. I eat every three hours, and if you're in between me and food, look out. And I kept forgetting my food. I'm like, this is a real pain in the butt. I st I, and I nailed it. I put my keys in the fridge. Okay? So that's the system. Absolutely. And, and well, the first day I go to the door, I'm like, where in the hell are my keys? And I'm like, oh, fridge. They're in the fridge. So, of course, I remembered my lunch. So, keys by whatever it is you need to take. That's my first systems tip. And there's, I, I mean, I have like 50 tips in the book, which came as a result of doing everything wrong, of course. The second thing is, that the little slips of paper, I'm telling you right now, go to whatever office supply store you frequent and get a 1 through 31 accordion folder, you know, for one for every day of the month, and every loose sheet of paper that you have to have, you get it off your desk or you rip it out of whatever, you know, or you copy it down off the palm of your hand, and you file it under the number of the day by which it requires action. It's genius. I'm telling you. I have like a thousand people doing this, and they love me just for that. Doesn't that sound silly? 1 through 31 accordion folder, I'm telling you. It's all that psychic garbage off your desk. And you remember to renew your driver's license or your, get your plates updated or whatever when you're supposed to do it. Okay? So those are just a couple of tips. Get a system. I'm telling you. Expect surprises. Okay, I have a great story about expecting surprises. Because most people think surprises are problems. They're ugly. They're difficult. All of that, right? I view surprises as a test to pass. I want you to think about that for a second. I view surprises as a test to pass. I have my share of them the last couple days. I'm sure you have too. Okay? Think of it next time it happens. Ooh, this one will not get the better of me. I'll pass this test. Okay? So here's a story. I've been fortunate enough to work with uh, some Formula One racers, and yes, they are complete maniac freaks, and I love working with them. 
And uh, I had a chance to meet Dario Franchitti. And Dario Franchitti won the 2007 Indy 500 by actually slowing down. It's a crazy story. So he actually won it by stopping after 113 laps. So it was no longer the 500, it became the 113. Okay? So here's a short story. The Indy 500 turned into the Indy 200 and then the Indy 166 as rain delayed and finally ended the race. After a three-hour delay at 113 laps, all the racers took to the track except for Frank Eady, who, by the way, is like the cutest race car driver known to man. Google him. All the women in the room, Google him later. Um, who suddenly had a punctured tire and he had to pit. As life would have it, that seemingly awful surprise put us on the strategy that won us the race, said Franchitti. After fixing his flat and entering the track, there was another cautionary flag, which he could never have predicted. Franchitti chose to stay on the track rather than pit like all the leaders did, and that was his pivotal moment. After a wreck, crazy traffic, and finally ran again on lap 162, Dario won his first Indy 500 at 166 laps by slowing down, by making a decision, and by responding to those surprises, unlike anyone else on the track that day. Won him race. Pretty impressive. Expect surprises, whether or not you're going at high speeds or not. The next one, first, love yourself, and then love others. Because love is the ultimate operating system. I have a lot of business people roll their eyes at this, like think, you know, I'm going to have everybody sing Kumbaya and all that stuff. And actually, I really notice who rolls their eyes at it because those are the first people that I want to have them increase the compassion for themselves because compassion is another word for love and then be able to share that with their coworkers, employees, mentees. So here's the deal. You know when you're flying on the plane and they give the whole oxygen mask speech, right? Put your own on first and then take care of anyone else who's traveling with you. If it works in a life-threatening situation at 30,000 feet and is not considered self-serving, why doesn't it work on the ground? I don't get it. I don't get it. Put your own on first. Love yourself first. First. I have some, I find women seem to have a particular problem with this. Um, and, I, you know, it's like they're going to go to hell if they love themselves first. Any of, I mean, it's, there's resistance to it. And I, I remind them of one of my favorite quotes, which is, it is possible, it is possible to be important to yourself and not be self-important. Duh, it's possible. The other thing that I have people think about this, and especially you know, for the for the men in the room, is you know, well, yeah, right, love. I'm you know, I can really do the love thing. You know, it's kind of different. Think about what you would do with a pet, or a young child, or your own child or how you would, what would have wanted to be treated when you were a young child. And be compassionate. Love yourself. Okay, I'm going to pick on a guy in the room. You. What's one thing, and no dirty humor here? That's what I do. Okay, well, see? Okay, then dirty humor is fine. Um, what's one thing that you can do to... Be good to yourself. One thing I could do. <laughs> <laughs> do I get a pass? Yeah. One thing I could do. Seriously. I mean, other than that, what else? <laughs> I can sleep in once in a while. Okay. Slacker. Total slacker. Okay. My problem is, you know, because my foot often has trouble in getting on the brakes. I realized recently that I had slept in on a weekend and got out. Oh, man, you were so due. So did you? Uh, I'm planning on it. <laughs> <laughs> did you not? 
telling you, Jake's my shill. Did you happen to take the quiz online? Okay, and that's okay. Um, and so here's what I'd like for you to do. do you, who do you know in this room? Are these your mentees? Okay. Who want, And what's your name? Now, who wants to hold Matthew accountable for sleeping late this coming weekend? And your name is Mitch the Hammer. Okay. All right. So how late are you? How, how late are you going to sleep in? That's awesome. Saturday or Sunday or both? Okay. Okay. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to call him in your sleepy voice no later, I mean no earlier than 10 o'clock. Okay. Done. Deal? Accountability? Okay. Perfect. All right. So that's proof that it's not that hard to love yourself and then share it with others because you can't give what you don't have. Can't give what you don't have. Okay. The next one. This is actually my, my favorite thing of the whole night. Say what you mean and do what you say because your integrity is up to you. Your integrity is up to you. So I had a client confess to me that she had a little bit of an, like a self-challenge. She was filling out her expense report and through like some Priceline freaky episode, she was able to get a flight for much, 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 much cheaper $250 cheaper than what was allowed or what she thought it was going to be. It was like a last minute thing. So she had a receipt for like 350 bucks, but she only paid like, you know, I don't know, 100 bucks. And as she sat there, she's telling me, looking at the receipts, she's thinking, man, this would be a great way to make 250 bucks. Nobody's going to know, blah, 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 blah. Does anybody see a big gap coming in here just any minute? Just like a Mack truck aimed right at her? And she called me, and she goes, I'm squealing on myself. I can't believe I almost sold my integrity for 250 bucks. And it almost made me cry. She almost sold her integrity for 250 bucks. Nobody would have known, but she would have known. Okay. There's a great story about, uh, and I know I only have five minutes. There's a great story <clears throat> about this. And because it's very easy to point outside of ourselves and say, well, they didn't do what they said they were going to do. A woman brought her son to Gandhi and said, please tell my son to stop eating sugar. I know it's bad for him. And he sat there and thought for a moment. Sorry, I don't do a Gandhi impression. You're going to have to go with, like, white Caucasian impression. And, um, and I said, or he said, bring your son back to me in a month. Now, get along, get along, bring your son back to me in a month. So she's frustrated. She's like, you know, Gandhi, and I'm here, my son, and he sent us away. Does he not care? So she dutifully comes back in a month. She brings her son to Gandhi, and she said, please tell my, tell my son to stop eating sugar. I know it's bad for him. And he looked at the boy and he said, don't eat sugar. It's bad for you. And the mother looked at him and she said, well, why couldn't you do that a month ago? He said, a month ago, I was eating sugar. Don't you love how that like, is like a stealth story? Like, oh. It takes a minute for that to sink in. Oh, well, then I better look at what I'm doing. Right. Okay. Give, be grateful. And I encourage you students to think about this when you're choosing a company to work for. Because I was fortunate and ended up working for a company that really gave to their employees. And I'm sure the companies of the mentors, the alumni mentors in this room, do the same. Look and make sure that the company you're looking at is a match for you. What leaders do you look up to? Why do you admire them? What behaviors do they demonstrate? Do they demonstrate gratitude? Are they giving? Is there plenty for everyone? Okay. Look at this, and look at it in your own life. One of the things that I say to people is, and I'll, just, I'll come up to you and ask you, did you give anything today? What'd you give? 
Was it good? Yes. Did they think it was good? Yes. How do you know? Because they listened to it. Okay. Did they act on it yet? Do you know? Uh, yeah. Okay. We went to class. Okay, good. <laughs> so you gave something today. Did you take the quiz ahead of time? Really? Because your integrity is up to you, right? Did you bring your printout? What's your name? I'm looking you up, Reggie. Here's a book. <laughs> so my advice is give something every day. I don't care if it's a smile, if it's a favor, if it's money, if it's time, food, study buddy. Give something every day. You, blonde, what's something you can give tomorrow? Okay, and what time are you going to do that exactly? Okay, does she know yet? Okay, all right. You on the aisle, what's something you can give tomorrow? Okay. Does he want a ride? <laughs> Just checking. Could be a joy ride, you know, I wasn't sure. Give something every day. And by the way, they've shown that giving releases all these great chemicals that make you younger and make you happier. So just the act of giving is a gift to yourself. I'm pretty sure sleeping late falls in that category, but I'm not positive. And then my other tip is whatever you want more of, what's something you want more of? Be nice. OK, sleep. So is there a friend you could help so that they would actually get more sleep? Be OK, and because there, of course there is. If you give away what you want more of, this funny thing starts to happen. You start to get more of it back. Give away more of what you need. I know it sounds counterintuitive. Trust me, I don't have time to explain why it works, but it's quantum physics, and it works. It is. I'm serious. I'm not making that up. It's really true. OK, the last one. Have fun and celebrate life, because having fun is good for you. I actually almost didn't include this in the book, because I'm like, of course, everybody knows to have fun. Are you kidding me? And this friend of mine said, you must be joking. There's so many fun-deprived people. You have to have a book about, how, I mean, a chapter about how to do it. So. What I did was I included all this great science about it, because it seems so obvious, like, well, yeah, schedule something on Friday night, make plans on Wednesday, go bowling on Thursday. I mean, it seemed kind of obvious, make time to read a book. But I learned there's all this amazing science around it. Laughing actually reduces food cravings, increases your pain threshold. So for those of you who are like, you know, arm wrestling for beer or something, OK. Increased pain threshold, helps you heal faster, improves your problem solving, and slows down the aging process. And it's free, OK? So have fun and celebrate life. Those are the 10 life-changing ahas, OK? Now, what I'd like to go to is the last item, which is, you'll recall, it was how to deal with problems that you cannot influence, right? So I know many of you took the quiz and already know your JQ. But if you're having a joy deficit kind of day or if all hell is breaking loose, Here's a technique I want you to remember. This is what I had the woman write on her hand with a Sharpie. It's very simple, four-letter acronym, B-A-C-K. It helps you get back on track. It's based in science. It stands for breathe, acknowledge, choose, and kick into gear. And I'll explain. The breathing is very important. It's actually the most important thing on here. Because you do not want to react until about a half of a second has gone by. So re research at uh, UCF SF has, in the 70s, proved that all you need is one half of a second between stimulus and response, between you failed your class and you lunging across the desk at your professor. Okay, Half of a second. Breathing is what buys you that half of a second. Because what happens is the reptilian brain gets out of the way. The, the, the brain that can save our lives but can also cause us to do things we later regret. And the sophisticated neocortex part of the brain gets in the way. I mean, it comes into play, excuse me. And so breathing buys you that half of a second to have 
reactive brain, get out of the way, sophisticated, results-oriented, decision-making brain come into play and prevent the lunge across the desk. Okay? So B stands for breathe, and it buys you that very important half of a second. Next time you do something that you regret, analyze it and break it down and find out how you could have stopped it with a breath and responded differently. Second thing is acknowledge. Notice what you feel and for a moment really feel it. At a client of mine, her daughter spilled purple nail polish all over the rug. And I, I had coached her on the back technique, which of course is lucky because she let her daughter live. And the acknowledge for her was, is just you do it in your mind, you do it privately. The acknowledge was, I'm going to kill her. So the acknowledge is not some pretty psychobabble, it's just whatever you're feeling at the moment. You just acknowledge it, and it dissipates it. Then you choose. So B-A-C, C stands for choose. Choose to feel differently. Choose your desired outcome. What do you want to have happen? What do you not want to have happen? Do you want a chance to retake the test? Do you want to be eligible for rehire? Do you want to not get a divorce? Choose your desired outcome, and K is kick into gear, or kick it in the ass, whichever you prefer. Act on your choice. What would the best me do? And this breathe, acknowledge, choose, and kick into gear, I'm telling you, if you'll start putting it into practice, you'll see some amazing results. And you'll feel much more centered and in control. So you live by the 10 life-changing life ahas. You have no gap. Your thoughts and actions are in alignment, and you are in your integrity. And you know how to make the best out of every situation when unavoidable problems come up. I'm going to close with a very quick story. <clears throat> I have to read it because it has too much, it has very literal quotes in it. So when you're having a really awful day, you're using the back technique, you're doing everything you can do. God, you know, it's just one of those days. Don't forget to use humor. Humor. You know, the funny bone? Humor. You may remember the flight back, some of you are maybe too young, but in 1989 there was a flight going from Denver to Chicago. It was the United Airlines, the DC-10. And they suffered that catastrophic combination of engine and hydraulic systems failures mid-flight. And if you've seen it, you'll, it's, you can't forget it, it's seared into your brain. The video footage showed the plane cartwheeling upon landing, if you could call it a landing, God help everybody, breaking apart and coming to a flaming stop at an airport in Sioux City, Iowa. It was gut-wrenching to watch. And for the 41 minutes preceding that moment, the flight deck was filled with focus, tension, and even humor as Captain Al Haynes and his co-pilot struggled to save their own lives and those of the 285 passengers on board. Okay, I don't know about you, this is a bad day. This is not the dog peed on the rug, or you forgot to pick up the dry cleaning, or you missed your homework. This is life and death right here. Fitch, co-pilot, says, I'll tell you what. Keep in mind, they have the situation. I'll tell you what. We'll have a beer when this is all done, Captain Haynes. Well, I don't drink, but I'll sure as hell have one. And later, just moments before they landed, the uh, ground control said, United 232 Heavy, if you can't make the airport, sir, there's an interstate that runs north to south to the east side of the airport. It's a four-lane interstate. The plane, we're just passing it right now. We're going to try for the airport. Ground control, United 232 Heavy, winds are currently 360 at 11, 360 at 11. You're cleared to land on any runway. And the flight deck said, you want to be really particular and make it a runway, huh? <laughs> Serious, this is from the transcript. And somehow, 185 people survived, including Al. Al has a life that doesn't suck. Thank you very much.